Yo, what up, guys? Welcome to the VIP Network Podcast. I'm your host, Juan Garcia, and I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly go over who I am, what I currently do, and I found the best way to do that is to actually just post an interview that I recently did with a Life of Freedom podcast where I go over marketing, communication, and using marketing and communication to live the lifestyle you actually want, connect with the people that you actually want to, whether that's high status men, whether that's beautiful women, whether that's people that can get you where you actually want to go in life. There's a pow- there's a couple of powerful tips in this message. So forget about me if you don't care who I am or what I do, that's completely fine but I do drop tips in connecting with these people, growing your Instagram, and I'll go over more tips on a very specific video later on down the line, but I just like to put this video out here as a second episode so that you guys can get a little bit background and we can go over networking, communication, and how it is I do what I do. If you've seen the way my Instagram looks, Juan Tucker Must Die, go give a follow right now. Uh, feel free to DM me. Ask me, uh, you know, how I get this done if you have any questions over this podcast. But just enjoy the podcast, guys, and take some value. That's what it's all about. So, Juan, it's uh, great to have you here. It's nice to meet you. So, uh, tell us, like, who, uh, who you are and what you do, like a basic introduction. Okay. Well, let's start with what I do right now. I'm a marketer that basically uses human behavior to help my clients get what they want whether that's yeah. more money or whether that's an awesome social life, right? You know, I deal with everyone from accountants to cannabis clients to comedians and even OnlyFans models. So that's what I do right now. I look at marketing completely different than the people that are maybe in your messages telling you, oh, I can get you all these followers, right? No, yeah. I look at marketing as communication. I don't even want to use the word marketing. I want to use communication and we're using okay. communication as a tool to basically get what we want and, you know, speaking on the name of the podcast, get the life we want, basically. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I do right now. And yeah. <laughs> okay. So what type of clients do you have? You talk about, you know, only fans models and like, uh, why do you go into that specific uh, niche? Right. Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll lead up, I'll give you a quick background and lead up into how I even got into marketing. Yeah. Right. So in college, I was actually studying accounting. And yeah. uh, through, through, I guess, the business course, you obviously have business classes. So I was in a business management class. And I just got frustrated with reading the textbook examples. And I yeah. said, you know what? I'm going to make my own t-shirt business because there's only at Texas State University, there was only one other t-shirt business, right? And then you had the bookstore. And I was like, wow, dude, like we, that's, they need some competition here. Like I can clearly enter the market and start selling t-shirts to the, that kind of had the college spirit around it. Right. And encapsulated what the people at Texas state liked. Right. So, you know, I saved up my money for my part-time job at McDonald's to make my first order of shirts. And with that first order of shirts, I only got five different schemes of a, of a tank top. It's summertime. It's a river city. So I went to pool parties. I went to the river and I put them on different people. I put them on different models and started taking pictures and I would give them, I would give them away at a party at these pool parties too, as well. And so, you know, that's how I, that business, that t-shirt business that helped me figure out I was actually that good at marketing when I had, you know, models like Julia Rose, who is Jake Paul's wife or girlfriend right now, I think. And that, that was back in the day when no one knew her. I just like, I'm good at recruiting talent. Let's go. So put the shirt on Julia Rose, help me market it, help, help me sell these shirts at Tellgates and stuff like that. Outsell the other brands at Tellgates so bad to where they had to talk to the athletic director to try to get me banned because they were making an exclusive deal because they wanted to be the only shirt, right? So they tried yeah. to do that. I, I talked to the athletic director. I didn't let them do that. And then you have other celebrities on campus that, you know, wore my shirt, like the sun God. And then from the sun God wearing my shirt, then big Nietzsche knows about me. He's a guy that I just met. I just, no, no, I didn't just meet him, but he was at a couple of my parties and stuff like that. And he became this really big influencer. And I actually saw him this past weekend at babes in Toyland. So it's kind of funny how that all works out, but I figured out, you know, through running that business, I didn't want to be the, you know, the fucking t-shirt guy. 
right? And I still wanted my accounting degree, like selling t-shirts was not going to take me where I wanted to go for me. So I finished okay. my, you know, bachelor's in accounting, got my master's in accounting, got a great fancy job at Pricewaterhouse Coopers. I didn't want to work in oil and gas in Houston where my job offer was. So, you know, I pitched them on letting me go to San Jose in Silicon Valley because I wanted to work in tech, wanted to yeah. look at cryptocurrencies. And, you know, this was 2017. And I, I really wanted to be a part of the first wave of people that were looking at big companies that were looking at crypto accounting. I had been involved in crypto since like 2014, pitching Mark Cuban freaking cryptocurrency exchanges right when Coinbase was pitching the same thing. Right. So you missed out, Mark. You missed out, Mark. I just want to let you know that. But uh, no. So I went to Silicon Valley. Uh, I could have had a great career over there at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was leading the firm really from a cryptocurrency standpoint. At a, and it's not usual to do that in a big four, such a, you know, the most prestigious firm yeah, yeah. in the United States. Right. Eight months in, you shouldn't be the leader of a, they shouldn't be asking you to start to lead a division. So I thought about that and I was like, dang, because I really went to Silicon Valley so I could learn from cryptocurrency people. And I was like, dang, well, I'm teaching the firm about cryptocurrency like this. This is a little bit ridiculous. And then, yeah, uh, yeah and Silicon Valley is filled with uh, entrepreneurs. So the entrepreneurs and the meetups that I would go to that were not in the accounting industry, they told me, Juan, dude, do you know how long you're going to have to be in accounting to get good? at accounting, you're already good at marketing because I was helping people with marketing on the side, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't mention this, but I started, a, I started my marketing business in college, but it was small. And I would do little jobs here and there for uh, artists and little, you know, even virtual gun ranges and that type of stuff and just yeah. help them with marketing. And, you know, I thought about what the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley were saying. They were like, dude, you're already good at marketing. Like just help a business with marketing because you can't help a real business with accounting right now, right? So you're working at okay. PwC 120 hours a week during busy season, which if you know anything about Silicon Valley, they work a lot more than other regions of the United States when it comes to, you know, just the things they got to look at with tech. And then you put tech into accounting and then we're just in the office seven days a week on, on a Sunday right? Do, yeah. Doing accounting. And like, you know, I even negotiated a raise in my first eight months just because I was such a hard worker. Like I wasn't the most technical accountant. I was just, okay. you know, I was not willing to give up. I was one of the only persons on my team that didn't cry. We had people there for 10 years that were crying on the job because it was one of them. It was one of my first job in accounting. My first audit was one of the toughest jobs that most of my team had seen in their career, right? Yeah. So I was like, dang, I, I, st I started off with the hard stuff and did really well. And I would have I loved to keep doing that, honestly, if the pay was there. But the pay wasn't there. You don't make that kind of money in a normal job. There's only, and even if you were at the top and making partner level salaries, you know, yeah. there's, there's a point to where you're trading time for money and, you know, the math just doesn't work out if you have incredibly big dreams, right? And that's not to say entrepreneurship is for everybody or what I'm about to tell you I did is for everybody because not everybody should do what I'm about to tell you I did. So I was looking at everyone around me. I was looking at the, you know, the older partners in the office, the managers, and I was just like, dang, dude. And I, rem I remember, and I remember being in high school and looking at my managers in McDonald's or like the old guys I would be working with in the kitchen. And I was like, "Dang, dude, I do not want to be like them. I better try fucking hard." <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I was. And now, fast forward to PwC. I was looking at the managers at Price Waterhouse Coopers, fancy job, get you know anything we want, put it on the company, right? Make you feel really good. But at the end of the day, you just don't get paid for the amount of hours you work. It's you get paid very low per, per hourly the way the math works out. Right. And I was like, dang, dude, I don't want to be like the people like looking at my, my superiors, my managers, my, you know, the partners above me, right? Like I don't see myself living that life. So I could, you know, spend five years here and then start my marketing business for real. And that's actually what I yeah. planned to do going in. But I was only eight months in at this point. 
And I was like, dang, here's what I thought about. And here's what I think a lot of your listeners should think about. You should compare yourself to the person five years down the road that had never made that big decision, right? So, so the way I looked at it was if I quit my fancy, safe job right now and start the tough road of entrepreneurship, after five years, that entrepreneur is going to be a better, a much better entrepreneur than the Juan Garcia that stayed in that, you know, those golden handcuffs for five years and then started entrepreneurship, right? And they oh, call yeah. it golden and they call it golden handcuffs for a reason. Who knows if that Juan Garcia ever would have got out of the handcuffs after five years, right? So uh, I didn't have that much in savings. I think I had about three thousand dollars in savings, which I don't advise everyone to quit their job and start a business with with that low low amount of savings, right? But I just saw an opportunity. I saw a gap in the accounting space specifically to where they I, I look I'll tell you this story. I drove up to San Francisco for one of my clients, right? Uh, I just remember, you know, I got there pretty early. So I was in my car and I didn't get on LinkedIn that much, but I was looking at LinkedIn and, you know, I have a lot of accounting connections. So I was looking at the, the way people were marketing their accounting firms, these accounting entrepreneurs, right? And then I was all, I was like, well, me being good at marketing, I was like, damn, they really suck at my marketing. They're, they're just not, they're not hidden. They're not hitting home with helping other people understand how valuable accounting is, right? Yeah. Or they're not, they're not just marketing lights out. It's kind of like cheesy, soft, uh, blank, you know, just bland marketing, right? And then I looked at LinkedIn for 15 minutes, literally looking at that in my car, waiting to go into my client. And then another 15 minutes I spent looking at what the accounting marketers were doing, what the accounting world had to choose from when it came to marketing, the, yeah. the entrepreneurs and the smaller offices, right? And I was like, dang, like they're okay, but I can provide something that's just not there, right? And then so boom, I went to work. Two hours later, I wrote the email to HR to put my two weeks in because I was going to start my media company and I was going to start it off the back of the accounting firm, basically, and, and solving their problem, right? That's the one thing in entrepreneurship that I think a lot of people have to roll with is solving someone's, some, someone's problem, right? So boom, started right there. My dad was like, are you sure about this? I'll never forget this. He sent me like an email, which he usually doesn't do. And he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, trust me, trust me. Like, this is going to work out. I got this. And then it's about making good relationships too, right? They told me I could always come back put in the two weeks respectfully when you're done with your work. But uh, yeah, that was a big jump. So I know I talked a lot there if you want to, you know. Yeah, I think yeah, so, but... yeah, it's a great story that uh, you have. Like, so you basically like going through a lot of things. So like you start from the beginning. So, so in the first question you answered, like, you know, your use of like human behavior. So how does it uh, like help in marketing? So how do you use that? How do I use that? You know, I've always had a keen sense for the way people react to things okay. and basically the way people act. I know that people, you know, there's a lot of experts out there that break it down to a science, but I just, you know, I naturally grew up realizing what people did and how they acted. I'll never forget when I was young in San Antonio, grew up very poor. I was eating, you know, I was eating tacos with my family at some taqueria, right? Like during the middle of the day or something like that. Everyone's everyone's poor. Everyone's like out of shape. Everyone's like lowly, like kind of humdrum walking around the fucking taco shop, right? And I was a kid. I was like in elementary. And um, there's this beautiful woman that walks in in a red dress. I'll never forget. And so I notice her walking in. But the first thing I do as a fucking kid is I look at all the other men in the restaurant to see if they're going to look and they all do. So I thought that was, I thought that was pretty interesting the way that I knew that I, I wasn't staring at the woman, right? I looked at yeah. her, I noticed she was beautiful and I was like, huh, who's going to react to that? All right. They all reacted to it. Right. And that, you know, fast forward to college, the first thing I did with my t-shirt company is got beautiful models because that's something people would react to, right? Yeah. And, you know, 
it's even what I do now to, to a certain extent. If you look at my Instagram, there's beautiful models all over the place. That's what people react to. But I hardly ever post about helping my insurance clients or helping my accountant pounding clients. I used to do stuff like that. But um, really, when we talk about marketing, you have to come to the realization of people act the way they do. And you can't necessarily be upset about it, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. with, yeah, you'll hear a lot of people complaining, like in the accounting world or the insurance world, like, why don't they think my stuff is exciting? Why don't they think my stuff is exciting? It's because it's not, it's just, it's just not exciting, right? Yeah, it's or, not exciting for other people. Like, you know, yeah, it's not, them, it's it not, could be. exactly. It's really exciting for them. It's not exciting for other people. So you said you, you saw me on a repost on Michael Sartain's page, right? Yeah, yeah. One time. Okay, so I just came from Babes in Toyland. Michael Sartain is the host for Babes in Toyland Charity. And I also never forget, he told, Michael Sartain told me this too a, a few years ago. You know, I was, we were talking about events and I, care, I have an accounting degree. I grew up poor. I care about financial literacy. It's a big thing to me, right? So I wanted to, I wanted to create a charity event that helped kids with financial literacy, right? That's what I wanted yeah. to do. I brought that idea up to him and I was like, dang, maybe we could, you know, get models there and stuff like that. He's like, dude, that's a bad idea. Don't, don't do that. Like you will not get the models that you think are there, right? You can invite a bunch of models, let's say to an accounting conference or a financial literacy thing, like, you know, out of 2000, maybe two will come, right? To that, to that type of stuff. So you got to okay. even, even with uh, these influencers and these models, you know, there's certain things that they, they care about. And you'll see, you know, ba Babes in Toyland kind of hone in on a lot of those different things, right? Yeah. One thing I will tell you is so basically he told me don't do the financial freaking conference, right? And what I got from that is instead throw the event that everyone looks at and then bring the accountants to that event or bring the, the, you know, the analytical minds, the insurance agent, throw him in the middle of the modeling event, throw him in the middle of the charity event, throw him in the middle of the bikini, the bikini competition and make that person even a judge. Maybe if you want that person as a client, if that yeah, makes yeah, sense, yeah. or, you know, even, even back to a lot of people hate on Ty Lopez, right? They hate on him because he's so good. They hit on him because he's flashy, but he gets the attention of a lot of a lot of kids. So one of the ideas I have in the future is basically based off of the way human humans act, right? Going back to your question, one of the ideas I have with you know financial literacy is shit. Throughout my life, I'm gonna be hey, look at my life, look at my life, like right. And I think I'm the person, the perfect person to do that. There's there's, there's no one that's listening to this that can't do that, but I believe there's a lot of people that wouldn't want to with the way their life is set up. And it's all about setting up your life the way you want to. And I, li I like my life, man. And But I have a lot yeah. bigger goals. So, yeah, I think uh, that uh, so what you're basically saying is that uh, you have like you developed, you know, like you take, like not what a lot of other people see, that you, you look at things at like a different angle. So, uh, if you can uh, tell, like, you know, what kind of things that people do to, like, you know, see, see the world that, uh, like, you know. You know, I'll say this. Think about what other people actually want, right? A yeah. lot of people talk in the iframe. A lot of people talk in the iframe. So, you know, people want different things. You can't necessarily go to the, the person with a lot of money and sometimes they money is not the thing that they want, if that yeah. makes sense. Or you can't you can't go to like um, the person that has it really going on with the women and think that they even need more women. That's probably not even what they want right now. They might want more money, right? Yeah. So you know, I'll, that's that's my biggest thing when it comes to human behavior. People need to focus more on what other people want. So my Instagram. I wish, I wish I could post like cryptocurrency stuff and people would care or accounting stuff and financial literacy stuff and people would care, but they don't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show them a lot of what they actually want to see, a lot of humor, a lot of memes, a lot of jokes and models, 
jokes and models in the same post, a model telling you a joke, right? Yeah. And then between between that, I'm actually going to mix in, hey, guess what, guys, I do this. Hey, guess what, guys, I do that. And a lot of people aren't going to look at that, but that's a better strategy than not having people look at you at all, right? Yeah. So you got to think about what other people want when it comes to, you know, whether whether you have that certain investor you're trying to get or whether you're just trying to get a bunch of followers on social media, what are the, what do the people want to see? Okay. So, so can you tell like, you know, any kind of tips and like, you know, how to grow an Instagram, like for your business or your personal brand? Sure. Perfect. Oh, oh man. I, lo I love this. So it's even, okay. So we're in 2022. Yeah. It used to be easier to grow an Instagram, right? Now, what you're going to have to do to grow an Instagram is you're going to have to collaborate with much bigger accounts, multiple accounts, not just one, and have them put you on, so to speak, right? Yeah. Have them repost your stuff. You found me because Michael Sartain reposted my stuff. And if you yeah. go look at my, yeah, if you go look at my Instagram, I don't have a lot of followers because I mean, I got deactivated. And when I got deactivated, I, I don't think, you know, I even had a lot of followers for, you know, I guess I had a lot of followers if you're pretty bad at, at social media, but I wasn't concerned with my followers, my follower count, yeah. as much as I'm concerned with who is following me, right? Because I could fake it. One of the things that I've seen a lot of people do is buy someone else's account, right? And then change the name. And now they have all those hundred thousand followers, right? 200,000 followers. I've seen a lot of people do that, but those followers might not match up with the people that you're trying to sell to. Right. So yeah, yeah. even though, even if you have your, so that's tip number one, right? Get people to repost your stuff, bigger accounts to repost your stuff. Uh, if you're making some type of service, actually give it to that, that ac big account for free, offer your services for free. If you're yeah. on the come up and just starting out, I got one of my clients, one of my accounting clients, he was doing taxes for a huge IG model, Kate, Katie Williams, right? She has like 700,000 followers, right? So yeah, yeah. he was doing her taxes for free so that then she could go ahead and promote him, right? So you might want to do things like that. Like that's a good way to not only grow your followers, but grow your Instagram, right? And then even me editing stuff for like big rappers, I've got even got them their first million viewed videos like Money Man. I did that for him. His first million viewed video on Instagram by me editing something and him reposting it. Right. And that yeah. ended up being his best post. So do something really cool like that. The second tip I'll give on that is focus more on who's following you than the amount of followers. Right. Yes, you do want the blue checks following you. Yes, you do want the people that are actually your customers following you. Right. Because there's a difference between fans and customers. And, you know, I think, I think that's my true expertise. There's a lot of people that can artificially pump the numbers up back to that message I m mentioned earlier. Oh, I'll grow your follower account by this much. Right. No, when a client comes to me and they're like, Juan, I want to use social media. First, I figure out what they want. Right. But what they want is usually business, it's usually landing sales. So I look at it from a profit over fame perspective. Even even third, third, I'll, I'll say this too on Instagram, tie that back into content and be prolific with your content, which means you're going to have to have something like a podcast like you have here, right? Invite different people on because what I'm going to do with your podcast, man, is I'm going to cut it up into different pieces and then show it to my followers. Yeah. And then you get more exposure through that, right? So that's another method that people could use. But yeah, man, it's, it's yeah, hard to yeah. grow now. So you, use your influencers. You're going to need to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that, that's a great advice. Then, you, know, you have to, you know, you have to take the time. So, so it, should, it could have been easier before, but you have to still do some kind of work. You know. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So, so like, how do you collaborate with like big accounts and like, you know, what kind of value can you provide and like, you know, how can you like actually get them to react? Okay. So there's, there's a few ways. I think one of the best ways is to actually um, collaborate with them in real life and go meet them at their yeah. events. That's one of the best ways. I remember with uh, Gary Vee, I really wanted to do business with uh, his 
his you know right hand man james orsini so what i did is i went to yeah. his super bowl meet and greet in atlanta a few years ago and uh, you know i just i just went up to him. me and my brother made a nice video for one of his clients for vayner sports i mean we're good at marketing so we made a nice little video concept and we showed it to him we, in the meet and greet right we showed him the video he was like oh that's cool i was like look what did i tell him I was like, look, I would love to have you on my podcast, but I want James Orsini on my podcast. I'd rather have James Orsini on my podcast than you. So that's his right hand man. And he looked at me crazy, dude. He looked, he looked <laughs> at me crazy. Shoot, this works, right? Even, even, even with beautiful women, when, when you tell them you actually want their friend, they're like, what? You don't want me? But uh, <laughs> I told Gary Vee I wanted his friend, right? I, I didn't want him. And uh, he was like, oh, shit, D-Rock, get over here, get this man on an email with James Orsini so he can be on my podcast, right? So now me and James Orsini actually have a relationship in the accounting world, right? Yeah, so yeah. super interesting. And then uh, with my brother, who was next in line, he then showed him the video. And I told him, look, I'm growing a small media company. My brother will work for me at some point. And my brother has worked for me before. My yeah. brother will work for me at some point but you can have him for right now. So he was like, oh shit, AJ, come here, get this man an internship. So he got a little internship interview from that. And at that point, they wanted him to finish college, which he did. And now, now he has a cool media job, not with them, but it's, yeah. that's definitely a way to, that's one way to do it is meet people where they're actually at, right? You want to meet some of the biggest influencers in the world, go to Babes in Toyland Charity, right? They got one you know, coming up in June. And I think another one this year in Las Vegas, I went to the one in Miami and I not only connected with, you know, influencers that I'm now going to do business with. And, you know, uh, I even connected with old influencers like Big Nietzsche that used to come to my parties and now we're going to do bigger business. Right. Yeah, yeah. So go to, the, go to those types of events. The second way I say to do it is do stuff for free for them, like back yeah. to that editing stuff for them. And pitch them that way, either in the messages or just start doing it and start tagging them. You never know. They might, they might repost it. You can do both of those things, right? And then yeah, the yeah. third way is invite them to something really badass. Like, let's say you, you're making the connections to get free tickets to the Super Bowl party, right? Because you went to, you went to Babes in Toyland. Now you know certain people that run uh, Super Bowl events. And now you can get free tickets to Sports Illustrated. So then you invite Katie Williams. You DM her. You invite her. Hey, you say you say something like, "Hey, got free, you know, Super Bowl tickets to Sports Illustrated party. Would you be against going? I see you love the 49ers, right? Oh my God! Like, let me go. Like, boom, she has a great time. Thank you so much, Juan. Like, oh my God. Then I pitch that same Katie Williams, that big influencer, on doing business with my accountant, and so. All this just has to do with figuring out what would be value, valuable to people and then even connecting the dots further, like taking it further than just meeting them and connecting with them. Because connecting with people is fine, but there's, there's certain names you don't want to name drop too early. I always tell my clients this, just because you can reach out to someone at the moment doesn't mean you should. Sometimes you should actually you know, meet them that first time and then just do that first meeting, just, you know, get kind of that mere exposure, meet them a couple of times. And then, you know, there might be a right time to actually provide them value and give them that ask. So that's what I'll say to that as well with meeting these, uh, you know, these higher status people. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a really helpful, like, you know, like for anyone that they did that to go and that. So I think it's like more important, like with connections that, you know, people have. So it's, it's like Definitely. it's not just for instagram it's just good for business like you know having the connections with people and yeah definitely and about creating connections it's just back to what i said earlier about human behavior figure out what people actually want right yeah so like you find people actually want and you can give to them so it's beneficial for them so um, exactly like how would you describe like the current like algorithm on instagram like what kind of content that would be? what kind of content Okay, so the algorithm on Instagram, honestly, dude, it's it's all it's all jacked up now. I wouldn't yeah. depend on an algorithm. Like people will say reels, 
But yeah. even then you have to, you know, just be smart about it. And it's, it's less about the algorithm and more about what sounds you see that are popping off, like the sounds you can use in the reels, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go on that sound, go on that trend, right? So yes. now, yeah, now it's, now it's more about hopping on the trend, like kind of how it is, sort of how it is on Twitter with hashtags, right? Yes. But do that same hashtag thing that you did in Twitter and back in the day. Now do that with the sounds on reels. The same thing with TikTok, right? I see that, you know, with a lot of my clients, it's actually better to get better to get attention on TikTok to then grow your Instagram. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, attention, you have to. yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can actually and you can actually make a TikTok con content pretty easily. You don't have to um, you don't necessarily have to make these hard TikToks or these hard dances or be super funny you know, let's, let's boil it down to, let's say the accountant. And I give a lot of accountant examples because like, dude, when I say they're the worst at marketing, I legit mean they're the worst at marketing. They are so bad that in every movie, they are the butt of the joke or in like just different social situations. Everyone always has a joke for accountants. And that is oh, yeah. directly tied to you know the way they've marketed themselves in that industry and the type of people that go in that industry so if you're like that and you're not as exciting or you're not you know down to make the long TikTok or the joke just record a podcast like this and put the podcast on uh, on TikTok with some pretty cool topics that people care about entrepreneurship and living an amazing life a life of freedom being one of them right so yeah. Actually, you're gonna now. Now you're gonna have to find your way around the Instagram algorithm. I also work with a lot of cannabis companies, and a lot of cannabis companies are shadow banned, so the algorithm doesn't even matter anymore, right? A lot of yeah. the OnlyFans content girls are shadow banned. The algorithm doesn't even at matter anymore. So now you have to think about different ways people can share your content or yeah. sort of piggyback off of different things. I also give this strategy as well people don't think about this i don't think people i've not I've never heard anyone give this advice maybe maybe I've, i have heard gary v give this advice in terms of you know kind of talking about the overarching scale of social media but not particularly particularly an instagram strategy in 2022 so an instagram strategy in 2022 is to go on huge pages huge you know pages that are talking about different topics in your yeah. industry or maybe you know pages where it would make sense that people would see you the, the type that you want to connect with yes, and give yeah. insightful give insightful comments in the comments or if someone's asking a question in the comments be the one to answer everyone's question if someone is trying to solve a problem which a lot of I do for a lot of my uh, cannabis accounts actually a lot of my cannabis accounts people are asking different questions or fighting over this and that in the industry and then you just go in there you make the most insightful comments and then you help different people out and through that a lot of people will follow you and then also on uh, meme meme pages and stuff like that and uh, you yeah. know in interact in the comments over there you you might be the top comment right so i said i said this about linkedin too back in the day but sometimes on LinkedIn, a leaving a hundred comments a week will make you tons more money than le than making a hundred posts a week. Okay, let me say that again. Leaving one hundred comments a week can and most of the time will make you more money than leaving one hundred posts a week, especially if no one is following you. I'm telling you, dude. Yeah, that sounds good. So you you should, you talk about like you know shadow and like editing. From that, like cannabis accounts or the fancy accounts. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of strategy do you use with those accounts, and like what kind of like other methods that you? Yeah, ex exactly what I just said as well. The getting getting people to share your content, making yeah, content yeah. so good that it's actually shareable, right? Because if it's not shareable, it's not going to work. So that that's a part of it. You got to think about what people find funny, what people find valuable, what they find entertaining what they find, you know, useful, they can use it as a utility. So, uh, you know, that would be first. And then the second one is it's exactly what I do with the shadow band uh, accounts is 
we go into comments of bigger accounts and start dropping hell hella knowledge in there like the other comments can't compete with the knowledge 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 we're dropping right yeah and you might get into kind of a debate all day with someone but through that debate with that person other people see how good your answers are and then they go and follow your account and interact with your stuff right and of yeah, course yeah, yeah. actually another thing that we do is contests and giveaways right so if you have an already you can pay for a giveaway you can pay to be the sponsor for a giveaway on another person's account right yeah so you can actually pay if you're trying to grow your shadow band cannabis account or if you're a dispensary that no one really has ever heard of, right? What you can do is pay to promote on Texas Cannabis TV, which is one of my clients, right? You can pay to promote on there and then we'll do the giveaway. And if we do the giveaway and tell everyone to go follow you, we're going to get you much more followers than you could have done on your own, if that makes sense, right? So you can sponsor yeah. giveaways, that type of thing. You can run giveaways. And people seem to react to that a lot. And you kind of have to figure out what they like to give away. And you might, might want to get spot. So let's say you can't afford to give away anything, right? Be the person that finds the opportunity to where that's even possible. And then talk to someone else that actually has the money to give away something cool, like a PS5 or like a $200 gift card to somewhere, right? And then you both join in on the giveaway and now they have to follow both accounts. So you can actually do it without money. You can be creative, if that makes sense. Yeah. So we talk about like the shadow band. So can you like actually like, you know, define the shadow band? Like, so like what is a shadow band? Like what kind of thing happened? So what? Oh man, different from dude, I hate, I hate the shadow band because your yeah. story views will go from, you know, an incredible amount of story views to then it's like one day it's like oh my god what happened like who's seeing our story now like what happened to our account and it's like oh we got shadow ban another one is you know people will type your name in the search bar on instagram and they'll have to type out your full handle instead of when you just you know type out a little bit of it it auto populates no it doesn't auto populate anymore when you're shadow banned they got to type yeah, yeah. out the full thing. And so that can be a huge problem as well when you're trying to connect with people or telling people to follow you and stuff. They might be like, dude, you're not here. I'll be like, dude, type in the whole thing. I am there. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to find you. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So let's talk about TikTok. So you, you talk about like it's, like it's so easy, it's much easier to go right now on TikTok. Mm -hmm. So what kind of strategies are there? Like, so I think the best strategy, if, you know, there's, there's different strategies for different industries on it, yeah. honestly. Right. And there's different strategies for different people. If you're willing to put in the work to make the funny TikToks, freak dude, do it, spend all your time doing it and post three TikToks a day. Right. Yeah. And you've, you've heard this, people have heard this like so many times at this point, post on TikTok, post on TikTok, post on TikTok. It's going to go away one day, just like, you know, just like Facebook went away, just like growing an Instagram really fast, really easily uh, went away, just like even gaining a tons of organic reach on LinkedIn went away. And it's you can still be successful on LinkedIn. It didn't go away that much. But TikTok is by far the biggest opportunity in organic in organic impressions, in organic reach, when you talk about, do you have the time to actually spend there? Do you have, like, are you, are you time? Like, uh, how do you say it? Do you have more capital in time or do you have more capital in money? There's two different types of people, right? So someone paying for a $50 course on something probably has more time to do that course than someone paying five thousand dollars that just needs it done for them right yeah. so if if you're paying money and you just need stuff done for you and you don't have time to make a lot of content or you're just not funny and you don't want to make spend you don't want to spend this time making content right what you should do is just either record a lot of your thoughts and cut them up or make a podcast and cut that podcast up and that's what i should suggest you can do because you yeah. can uh, use that content from
from multiple angles when you can use that podcast from multiple angles. So I always tell my clients this, if you think you're going to make a podcast and just get up there and give advice by yourself, I think that's one of the most ridiculous moves to do. That's one of the losing chess moves. And you got, you got to realize you're not, you're not Joe Rogan. Like Joe Rogan doesn't even do that. Joe Rogan doesn't even get up there by himself. He has a guest every episode, right? And so he's yeah. using that as a network tool. And so I encourage people to make their podcast and use that as a network tool that they can make relationships with the people they actually want to make relationships with. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, maybe do business with them six months down the line or whenever that opportunity strikes, even if it's the next day. It, because after you're, you inter- you're interviewing that person, even if you didn't know them prior to the interview, you now have a much deeper relationship with them than just asking them for some kind of shit, right? So, so that's one thing that a podcast is great for networking. And then you take that same podcast, the hour long conversations, and you cut it up into you know micro, micro pieces of content that you can then put on Instagram, you can then put on TikTok, okay? And make your whole page full of TikToks and really get traffic from that, right? And, uh, you know, I was going to say something else. Oh, yeah. Speaking of micro content, I mean, in the past 48 hours, yeah, in the past 48 hours, I think I edited about 70 videos, 70 pieces of micro content for my clients. So it's something that actually matters. It's something that actually works. It's something that my clients have really found success in and Honestly, that strategy just completely changed their lives. I'd be lying if I said it didn't. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So you talk about like you know, or like, like using like uh, small tapes and from that kind of stuff, like to go, to grow a podcast. So any other strategies? That you have? Yeah, you know, check this out because a lot of these strategies tie into some of the things I already said. Yeah, so yeah. let's let's say you can't just message someone and get them on your podcast, right? Yeah. You, a lot of times you can't just message someone like Gary Vaynerchuk and get him on your podcast. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, pe- people like that, whoever you want, a big time name, right? You can't just message, let's say, Andrew Schultz and get him on your podcast. Instead, what you do is you fly to their freaking event, you pay the yeah. money to go to their meet and greet, you actually meet them, and then right when you're right in front of him, you just make the ask, right? Yes. And if you, and if you really want to play chess with him, <laughs> you don't invite them on the podcast. You invite their yeah, best yeah, friend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, so tell like, how would you like, how would, how would you start like marketing like for a new client? Like when a new client comes to you and they say mm-hmm. they need your help, like how, how would you start with that process? Okay. Perfect. You got it back to you got to figure out what people want, right? So yeah. when someone comes to me with marketing, I'm legit. I have it on my piece of paper. I'm trying to figure out what one, two, three problems you have that I actually have A, B, C solutions to, right? Yeah. Because, you know, and tying that w- together with what they want, right? Because a want is different than a problem that you have right? So the want could be, I want money, but I'm not getting a lot of leads. I'm not getting a lot of attention. I'm not getting a lot of, you know, people are leaving me on red. Those are all problems that then you can have A, B, C solutions to. So that's, that's how you should look at it. You know, when it, when it comes to entrepreneurship, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs throughout my years quit their jobs because they don't like having a boss. And, you know, respect to them if they could make it work out, but that's more of an emotional thing rather than a logical thing, quite honestly. Right. So if you remember back to my quick story that I told you, I quit my job because I knew I could solve a problem and I could solve it right now. And it would be, I was ready to solve it. Right. So I wasn't just like, oh, this would be fucking cool if I quit. No, it's like, motherfucker, you better solve that problem before someone else does. Right. So. I think Elon Musk talks about that. Like the, the bigger the problem, the more you're going to get paid. Something like that. <laughs> okay. So, um, so let's go back to you know stories. So from the college days, so, so you mm-hmm. started. Uh, so would you say that like the T-shirt business like was your first business or you had? Anything? 
Right. I mean, I sold, <laughs> I walked around with a box of chocolates in high school and I outsold yeah. the cheerleaders who were selling world's best chocolates, kind of plain Jane chocolates. So what I would do is go to Sam's Club and buy, you know, the $15 chocolates thir- for 30, 30 bars for $15 of the really good chocolates that people yeah. actually wanted, like Snickers and Reese's and stuff, Skittles and stuff like that and sell the good candy. And just, you know, not even have to really, uh, this was in high school, not even really have to sell. You don't really have to sell stuff like that. You just sit down in class, sit down and lunch and people want the thing, right? So, uh, I mean, I was an entrepreneur from an early age. I mean, I didn't even get into this. I tried to sell drugs in sixth grade and got caught and got sent to alternative school in sixth grade, dude. Yeah, yeah. Like that's how, like, I've always wanted money from a young age. It's just something that... I didn't have it. It was it was a scarce resource, not only in my family but in my neighborhood. And then to top it off, everyone would talk about, "Oh, money is not everything." But then money is, or money is the root of all evil. But then I'm legit seeing money be the root of all problems, like quite quite literally, right? So yeah. that was a big mistake when <laughs> when I was in sixth grade, trying to sell drugs from the older kids and got caught. But um, no, I was, I was a good kid after that. Really good kid, actually, from where I come from. And then in college, before I started that business, I actually flipped watches. So I bought them on Facebook Marketplace for cheap yeah. and then sold them on eBay, cleaned them up. And sometimes you would run into really good deals. So just little entrepreneurial stuff like that. I would say like business-minded. That t-shirt was my first legit business, but it wasn't my first entrepreneurial venture, if that makes sense. It's my first yeah, business yeah. where I went downtown to the municipal court and filed the freaking DBA, right, <laughs> to do business. So that was pretty, yeah, that was pretty interesting. interesting. And um, if I did that business today, I would fucking kill it. That was just like a big learning lesson. I'm not going to say I did badass at that business or anything, but it definitely taught me a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, so would you say, like, you know, like being an entrepreneur, like that should, should that like come from, like, you know, from your birth or like you know do you think like people can develop like, certain skills to you know like, this? dude i don't people say that right born are you a born entrepreneur or not dude i don't believe entrepreneurs are born i don't believe yeah, yeah. they're born at all there, there just comes a moment in life whether that's in freaking elementary or sixth grade or like high school or, or wherever you're at it can come even you know later on when you're a freaking $300,000 partner at PwC. And now you want to quit and be an entrepreneur, right? So it's not born. You just realize it, it. Oh man, good entrepreneurs. It's when you realize things can just be taken to the next fucking level and you have to take matters into your own hands, right? It's not about, Oh, I can't have a boss. Like people like Mark Cuban say he's a sucky employee. Well, that kind of, that does kind of suck. That is a kind of sucky quality to have. Because if you're a sucky employee, guess what you have in business? You have clients in business. So you're basically your client's employee. Like, I don't have to do what they say. Actually, actually, I don't have to do what my clients say. I'm an entrepreneur. I don't have to listen to anyone, but I, I'm going to get fired. They're not going to pay me, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're they're, 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 they're going to quit the program, right? So no, man, I don't think entrepreneurs are born. I think they're made out of necessity. I think they're made out of realization. And I, I think they're made out of, you know, wanting a better life for them and their family. Because like, let's go back to not people just talk about the nine to five. No, no, let's talk about a prestigious job, like a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, most prestigious accounting firm, right? Doing really hard stuff. There's only so much money you can make for the amount of time that you put in. And I thought, yeah. shit, if I'm putting in 80 to 120 hours every single week, like not, there's no 40 hour work weeks in that profession, like every single week, then why don't I just start a business? Cause that'll be just, you know, that'll be the same amount of work, if not more, like, like, let's just do it. Right. So yeah. if you think you're going to be an entrepreneur, cause it's cool, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. yeah. So like, let's talk about like, you know, like, uh, like since if you, if you're in a job, you have a boss, like you, know, like you have a manager. Like when you're an agency, like you have a client, so so we have to mostly do like what they tell us, like you know they, they have their requirements. So what's the like difference between like having a boss, like and have a client? 
having yeah, a boss and having a client okay man dude well i would say there's quite a big difference in terms of you know the client can fire you anytime they want based on, based on the contract you make of course but the yeah. client can fire you anytime you want with a boss they can't necessarily just fire you for just any reason you actually have to mess up or i would say you get more chances with a boss right you just get more chances with a boss with a client like because a boss is going to have to they got to develop the team so they got to care about you and like there's certain company policies you can't fire this person for that or so many strikes or whatever the clients do they don't think like that they're th not thinking about you or your well-being they're thinking about themselves right so yeah, you're yeah. serving your client and you know you're over delivering for your client as well this whole you might have heard the saying the old saying uh under promise over deliver right yes. yeah. you know what will get you more sales if you actually over promise and over deliver and i mean over deliver like yeah. um yeah. man i remember when i first started my business there's a lot of contracts i shouldn't have got myself into to where i over delivered like a motherfucker that was fun and i grew their business but didn't do a lot for my me financially, but at least, you know, I got some good stories out of it. And then now I'm doing the same thing over over promise over deliver. Like you shouldn't. I come from a humble background. Right. And I think it's a losing. I think it's a losing game to be humble. And what's worse about that game, if you're being humble because there's you think there's some type of reward from being humble, then I think that's evil. I think that's kind of machiavellian you're you have ulterior motives right i'm being humble i'm being altruistic so that that people can can do more business with me no dude you should be you should be humble when you're actually on top you should be humble when yeah. you're actually on top but when you're fighting for it no let's let's make noise man i know i know how i can help your business i'm small i know you haven't heard of me but i know i can help your business like this and I would be lying to you if I didn't say I could change your life, right? Yeah. So that I'm making those type of sales, right? And I am changing lives. So okay, yeah, I think yeah, that's a like that's a, that's a really good tip, you know, like like everyone, you know, when, when they get successful, like you know, maybe, maybe they you know get uh, uh, like uh, what you say, like PK or something, yeah, something like that. Uh, something yeah. like that. So like back to back to the like the T-shirt business. So you you like you identified the opportunity like you know there's a there's a t-shirt shop that they, that you, you you can like make a proper competition like you buy models and you know, so, um, like uh, mm -hmm. can you like go through like in like in detail uh, like what kind of so how was like the business process like you know do you, do you have any like do you hired anyone or do you like you know just uh, like you know like do you have any, like, uh, you know like kind of like freelancers like working with you like you know like photographers or models or how does that that work? Nice. Okay. Great question. So I'll tell you exactly what I did. I, so I was working at McDonald's. I was kind of figuring out the math of what it would take to buy t-shirts, which these yeah. days you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't. This was like back in 2013, 2014. And I didn't know about drop shipping, right? Now you should yeah, probably yeah. drop ship your t-shirts, but I had to buy my inventory first. So I went to the print. I got, first of all, I freelanced a logo maker to make the logo, right? Yeah, yeah. Made, actually, no, that wasn't my first logo. I made my first logo. Like, in, uh, dude, I didn't know shit. I made it this thing in like PowerPoint. I made yeah, my yeah. first logo in PowerPoint and like I took it to the screen printing shop and I was like, huh, I need five tank tops of these five like different colors, right? So at first it was five tank tops of five different colors. And my marketing plan was, I was going to see if people actually liked it. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I got my first couple models and we went out, we took some photos, put it on Twitter, put it on Instagram. Then that's when I started going to pool parties and going to the river and putting my shirt on people just to take the picture and then taking it back off of them. Right. <laughs> and they would do it. I don't know why they agreed to that. <laughs> like, I'm not getting so appreciation. Yeah. It, it was, it was so mean, funny. But then at some point I did start giving out free t-shirts yeah, at pool yeah. parties and stuff like that. But uh, so, so that's, that's the first process I went through to even get the material so that I could then market. Actually, let me back up. Okay. Keep that yeah. in mind, right? Dude, 
I just remember this and I'm so glad you asked the question because I started marketing and making the social media account for my business on Twitter and Instagram, but mainly on Twitter and started, you know, just telling funny university jokes in the university thread so that I could grow my brand before I even had any t-shirts to show, right? Or any mock-ups at all. I was like, look, here's the idea. We have a t-shirt company. I had the ethos like, here's the idea. We have a t-shirt company. 10% of profit goes to the San Marcos River Foundation. And like, that's a, we want to keep the San Marcos River clean, right? It's a, it's a college town that really cares about nature. And like, that's kind of the thing over there, very close to Austin. So similar values there. So I just, I just marketed my eyeballs out for months before I even bought the t-shirt. Then boom, now I buy the t-shirts, put it on people and the pool party, take them off, right? Yeah. Get the freak, get the pictures. And from, from there, the next step was getting more models to then work at events like the Texas State tailgate. Like the tailgates, that was my favorite event because we would sell out or damn near sell out every single time. Like people just loved it. Like talk about branding, right? People just loved it. They loved what we were about. And I would have, you know, even models like Julia Rose, I would give them a commission and it was very, very low. I remember for a full day at the tailgate, (laughs) one time Julia Rose, if you look up who she is right now, her selling t-shirts for me, she just made $20 at the tailgate, right? Like, God dang, that's a lot of work. And the way I was like pushing them, like, hey, talk to that person, talk to that person, take a, take a picture with that person. Like, da, 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 da. let's just sell, sell our eyeballs out, right? Yeah, so I was like, commanding a sales team of basically, you know, attractive college girls that just wanted to be a part of that, even that brand that I built. And I'll still have, you know, a lot of those models to this day that even started with me, you know, talk about giving me my props on how good leader I am. And I'm very humbled that they even say stuff like that online because, dude, that's me just barely learning business, right? And so I did that same process for a couple of years, kind of. Uh, and then I'll take that even further. I, I even you leveraged that to then do business with people that had other businesses in San Marcos, like a party bus, right? Yeah, yeah. So then we're bringing t-shirts on the party bus and doing business with a guy named Sacred Thomas, who some, some in the community, community may know who he is back in our college days. And now we're set up to do business again in Austin when we're talking about media or Tulum or something like that. So super interesting stuff. I did that for a minute and I made some money. It was paying the bills. It was like legit paying rent, but it wasn't making that much. I wasn't like, oh yeah, I should keep being the t-shirt guy. Right. So, and then at some point I just stopped and I started helping people with marketing because I was like, I can, I learned marketing from this. Let me help you with marketing, like a small gun range, like stuff like that. Yeah. So it's like, uh, you realize like you, you can uh, like, you know, like you do like much better, like, you know, with helping people like with your knowledge. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Building brands, realizing what gets attention, realizing what people like realizing how to connect the dots. So it's very humbling to look back because I look back, I feel like I sucked, but I guess I was pretty good for the time around the people I was around. Yeah. So, you know, I just got, I just got reminded about something when it comes to the algorithm, because, you know, we were talking about it so much earlier and we were talking about shadow bands earlier, but Look, here's what you have to realize when it comes to marketing, especially on social media. Over the years, I've just seen algorithms change so much, especially when you talk about things like Facebook ads or you're running uh, running ads on uh, Instagram and things like that, or you're running numbers or a certain strategy, right? And depending on the algorithm a lot, that can get you into a lot of trouble. So if you follow a lot of people, that say they they know the algorithm or th- there's this update on the algorithm and that date that update on the algorithm that's okay that's fine but don't be dependent on that you rather what you can depend on is human behavior and the way that human yeah. beings act when it comes to you know just what they pay attention to in general right 
So I'll say that about the algorithm. You can't be always chasing the algorithm around because you'll lose a, you'll lose a lot of money that way. And I've seen it before. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about like uh, back to the t-shirt business. So you talked about like you know you know you made your logo, you you made your business thing. So so like you you did it before you you took the pictures and you know. So like how do you like kind of hire models and like so do you pay them before or they come for the exposure or like how does it? Right. I gave them a free t-shirt to take yeah, the pictures. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I did. And, you know, with the model that I had, who actually turned out to be a model, like a yeah, huge, yeah. one of the biggest influencers out there, uh, her, I just noticed her at the tailgate and I said, Hey, do you want to be a part of helping me grow this brand? Like, yeah, let's yeah. have dinner. Right. So we actually went out to dinner and then the next day, I think we went to go take pictures and stuff like that yeah. for for a line that for a new line that we had coming out. And then so you go from the ask to, you know, at least at least having dinner, right? To talk to talk business. And then going out to Bikini Hill and San Marcos to take pictures, developing that relationship. I'll tell you this about Julia. She's pretty fucking funny behind the scenes. What you see on camera, she's actually that way. So she <laughs> Pretty pretty funny character. I won't let any uh, uh, private stories slip out, but let's just say she's a funny character. Um, and then, you know, having something that people can actually get behind, honestly. Yeah. That, that's, why, that's why I think a lot of uh, the models I had at Texas State really liked that brand is because it had a good, it had a positive message. And uh, we, were, we were giving back to the river that we actually wanted to stay clean. So it was for a good cause, right? And then, yeah. and then let's let then let's do this. We actually had a little competition going with another brand, Sound Marvelous, right? So I actually right now I work with one of their models from the past, actually. So we had a little competition going, and the girls cared about that as well. Like they wanted to outsell, outdo Sound Marvelous. So that was pretty cool. But um, yeah. no, I, I mean, we we're all in college. I just gave them free T-shirts. I gave them a free, you know, opportunity, I guess. And, you know, that's a different opportunity than what I give a lot of models that come to my different networking photo shoot events now is shoot. I give them a mansion. I give them a yacht. I give them cool photos. Some of the best photographers in the city. Right. So that's that's how you bring value to you know, people like that. And uh, sometimes they ask to be paid and I'll just say, Hey, it's a networking shoot, right? I know brands that could pay you, but you got to come to my, we got a network. You got to come to my networking shoot. So yeah, yeah. How is it like different from like back then versus now? Like, yeah. It's, it's a, in, in the sense of the type of girl or just the time period. So how like the experience, yeah, the type of girls and what's the difference from like when Back okay. Right now. Okay. So that was that was in in college when yeah. none of us really had anything. And yeah, there's there's girls in college that are pretty big models, right? But yeah, yeah. comparing that to now, now you have OnlyFans, and you know you're able to post on in Instagram even and get even more attention as an attractive woman, right? So what a lot of girls will do is leverage that into the ability. You know, getting invited to yachts. Guess what? I'm one of the ones that invites them to yachts. I'm one of the ones that invites them to uh, villas in Miami to do a photo shoot before Babes in Toyland, right? Yeah. yeah. Or, or even be a host at Babes in Toyland. And so it's just now I see that, you know, people are wanting more and more value when it comes to, you know, models. And I don't even like to use that word anymore. I like to use the word influencers. So okay. you're seeing influencers want more and more value. There's some pretty big influencers I talked to back in the day that were, you know, this was around 2015, 2014, that wanted like $2,000 per post. There were those influencers still back then. But now those same influencers are even bigger and it might be 200,000 per post or 100,000 to work with them, quite honestly. When back then they were only asking me for two thousand dollars, I wasn't gonna pay it, but it was pretty cool to see that and be in those conversations 
with a couple of the brands that I worked with trying to get influencers to promote their music or what have you. Yep. So, yeah, um, I'll just say that people are people are expecting, you know, bigger and bigger things. So see what you can be creative about and put something together. Yeah. How would you like uh, find like good photographers? OK, that's a good question. So let's say I'm going to, you know, where have I not been? Let's say I'm going to New York, even though yeah. I know I know some event coordinators in New York. So let's say I don't know anyone. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to New York. So all I do is hashtag, you know, all I do is search hashtag New York photography, New York photographer, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I find the big photographers in the city or the ones that even fit with my style, right? Of the shoot that I'm trying to put together, whether that's for an event, a concert, a charity event, a big party, or a very, very private photo shoot, right? Yeah. I find those types of photographers through the hashtags. then. You might want to look at what you might want to go to their tagged section on their profile, right? Where yeah. they're tagged. And then it's going to show the models that they've worked with that tag them. And then those models, if they also live in New York, I want to know what models those photographers worked with as well. And then you can just, you know, go down the rabbit hole and find a bunch of photo photographers and models like that, quite honestly. But I'll tell you what I'll do. So that's the answer if you don't know anyone, right? Yeah. Let's say you start out not knowing anyone and you know you develop your network and you start knowing photographers in different places, big places like Miami, big places like Las Vegas, right? Even LA. And you start knowing other event coordinators. You can then just ask these people, um, hey, who are the best photographers? Like, let's do an event with them. Let's uh, invite this photographer, that photographer. Right. I don't know if you've heard of Orangutan and Joey Wright, but I was actually at their at Orangutan's party the other day, about two weeks ago, his birthday party in yeah. Miami. Never thought I would have ended up there when I actually hosted my event in Miami. But one of the photographers that uh, was at my event in Miami actually invited me to that party. So, you know, I went up, I, I uh, met Orangutan, which he's a pretty great person to know. But, you know, I asked him to, I didn't ask for anything much. I was just like, wow, this place reminds me of Austin. Like, maybe we should do something in Austin sometime. And he's like, man, maybe we should. So, you know, back to that whole, you don't want to ask too much off the bat. You kind of just want to meet someone first and develop, start developing a relationship. So, yeah, yeah. Right. So it's like, uh, you have to, you know, like, like be acquainted with them or like provide value first or something like that. Yeah. So that's what I would do now. Right now, today, I would rather get introduced than meet someone cold or I would rather invite them to the expensive Super Bowl party that I can get them into for free or yeah. an event like Babes in Toyland where I can actually make them a host, right? Or have them be even a photographer or a videographer at a big yeah, event yeah. like that, that they would find valuable. So I, I would still do that to this day. But like, let's that other scenario is just like where you don't know anyone. You just like maybe pop in town for a day or you don't know anyone in that town. Yeah, you got to go through yeah. the hashtags and yeah, start searching the where they're tagged and stuff like that. OK, so you talk about like Super Bowl, like, you know, getting there. So can you talk more about that? The Super Bowl. OK, yeah, I keep bringing it up because uh, my brother is involved in sports media. And so yeah. every year we're going to actually go to the Super Bowl. One of these years, we're going to have our own Super Bowl event, right? But for now, we've just attended events like the Gary Vee thing, showed up in person, you know, kind of made that relationship over there for the first time. I forget this about the Gary Vee thing too, is my mentor, my first mentor that I hired, David Meltzer, He's a sports marketer. He's very yeah. well known in the sports marketing. Well, yeah, I don't know if you've heard of him, but that's yeah. what I did on. You've heard of him. Great. So check this out. I put in my two weeks, right? Go back to PwC. Yeah. I put in my two weeks. First thing I do is I hire David Meltzer to coach me because I had met him because he had been on my cryptocurrency podcast that I had back like when I was in start when I had just moved to Silicon Valley. So I actually had David Meltzer on my podcast even before I asked him to, uh, and I went to one of his events before I asked him to coach me. 
actually. Yeah. Or no, maybe that was after. He, no, I wasn't at one of his at his events. So I went to. Uh, I invited him on my podcast, made that relationship. Then after that, asked me to asked him to coach me right after I put in my two weeks, and uh, I was talking to him day one, day one of entrepreneurship, eight in the morning, talking to David Meltzer. So let's go. And uh, re- me and my brother really want to be involved in the sports world. So Dave, and back to if you didn't catch that, David Meltzer was at that same event, and yeah, so. Yeah. He even, I even knew someone important in the room that was speaking by the time I got there. And then uh, with the whole, the whole Super Bowl thing, it's sort of hard to put an event together. And that's really what I want to do. So what I'd rather do is help someone else put on their event. Or now yeah. I'm getting to the point where, shoot, we might have a big uh, Super Bowl photo shoot before some type of big event, right? Uh, I don't know if you've heard of, Luke Krogh, but he actually invited me to a Super Bowl party where he had G Easy, and it was kind of his birthday at that time, I guess. Yeah. So I was looking at his Instagram stories at the time, and I saw him. He was down the street from us in Miami during the Super Bowl week, a couple of days before the Super Bowl, and I was like, "Hey, man, like, love to join you. I'm actually down the street. Me and me and my brother are here." And he was like, "Oh yeah, come here. I'll get you in." So we waited in the lobby at I think it was Fountain Blue Hotel, and. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're waiting for a minute and my brother is like, dang, is he actually going to come out? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, he, he's DMing me right now. Like, I think he's going to he's going to come get us. And so he comes out of these doors, pulls us into like this secret room. You go from like the lobby to like this big party with like models and like important people and stuff like that. And uh, he gets us our, you know, wristbands and they're like, hey, have you bought tickets? He's like, no, they're helping run the event and stuff like yeah. that. Right. So I meet a few models. When I'm there, you know, Michael Sartain is like doing his thing on the mic, like kind of, I, I forgot, I forgot if they had actually had a bikini competition there. I think they did. I think Michael Sartain was hosting a bikini competition. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. uh, it turned into a concert where g Easy actually, you know, came to the stage and Luke actually put us on stage. So that was pretty cool. But that still wasn't my own event. That was taking part in someone else's event and, you know. It's pretty cool that when I went to that event, Luke was like, Luke told the girl, oh, yeah, they're helping us run it. Like, we didn't do shit. We just showed up. (laughs) So so I'd really love to put a badass Super Bowl event together someday. And that will happen. So and then and then back to relationships like that as well. One thing I did do at that same Super Bowl is uh, I looked on. I believe it was Michael Sartain's story, and uh, he he was promoting the Sports Illustrated a Super Bowl party, right? Yeah, yeah. And I said, "Hey, I have I have an influencer that would love to go to that party, right?" And that was Katie Williams. She had she had a great amount of followers. San Francisco fan, so she was she was in Miami for the Super Bowl. And he was like, "Great, reach out to Steve Fowler, who runs Babes in Toyland, right? He can he can get her a pass into that party, right?" what he did he got her passed into that party i wasn't even in town at that point i had left the day prior but it's pretty cool to be able to put the pieces together like that and provide even people like you know steve fowler value and bring you know more influencers to super bowl party yeah i think i heard of low pro like from j mcdaniel talks about you know michael sartain and uh, him like being his mentors so like you talk about like like events in Super Bowl, so like the Super Bowl is the big event, like you know, with the football matches. So like these are like the events like you like held like prior to that event. So like before because like a lot of people come yeah. there and like yeah. Yeah, and that that's a good point. And you know, that's that's relevant to what happened recently with one of my events. But I'll I'll say this, you kind of wanna you don't want to set up shop where people there's not foot traffic, right? Yeah. So that's why I liked the the Texas State tailgates so much. Yeah, yeah. I set up shop there and I sell out in one day where I've been. Yeah, because marketing. Like come. yeah exactly. Or I do my photo shoot before babe the day before Babes in Toyland and make sure Babes in Toyland and everyone else knows about it, right? Be yeah, re- yeah. be respectful and actually ask them if it's a good idea to do it the day before or the day after. They said the day before. So we went ahead and did that. And you know, we have Babes in Toyland hosts showing up and we have great photographers showing up and stuff like that. So it's centering your, if, if you're doing events, 
and you're starting out, especially when you're starting out, you really want to center it around something people are already doing anyway, if that yeah. makes sense. Right. Like, let's so, say if they are coming to an event, so if you have a, like something before, so they can come. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to, let's say you're at cannabis, you got a cannabis company. You don't, for the cannabis company, you don't want to be the cannabis company yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Go, that goes and does your event at the cannabis convention, like where all the other cannabis people are and all the, you know, all your competition is. You want to yeah. go where, to what people are already doing, like a big music festival where maybe Snoop Dogg is performing and you do an event there at the music festival or have a booth there, right? So let's, let's not get confused and think we're so important that people need to come to our events. Specific. Have, have, yeah, have your events where people are already going anywhere. Yeah. It's like, you know, like, uh, like having them, like social media because like people just come to Facebook. So we need to have presence there. Like, exactly. Or, or going in the comment section of a yeah, big yeah. account and dropping knowledge. Yeah. So the tailgates. Uh, so I think a lot of people are maybe not familiar. I'm not much familiar with that. So can you like tell like about the concept of tailgate? Like, and uh, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. So tailgate. It's almost like, it's almost like a festival. It's 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 almost like a small festival in a parking lot, and we have them before football games. So yeah, yeah. yeah across. I think, across I, love, uh, I think uh, like a lot of movies some uh, like show that those kind of things. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, there will be different fans and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's a good place for a business to set up for sponsors to go and stuff like that. Hey, come to our booth. Check this out. At our booth, we had models and we had beer pong going on. You could play beer pong with the models, actually. Yeah. And, th and then we had spon We actually had a sponsor, an alcohol sponsor. Uh, and dang, we met back in college, but I forget the name. It would You'd slap, you'd slap the bag. It was like, it was like, it was, uh, <laughs> it was alcoholic punch in a wine bag and yeah, people yeah. really like that. And they got, that girl actually got a million dollar investment from Mark Cuban on Shark Tank. And that was actually the biggest deal done at the time. And so they okay. sponsored our, our uh, tailgate as well. So yeah, it's just, these, there's these big festivals before events and I live in Texas and, you know, American football is big over here. So there's obviously a lot of people there. <laughs> do you like make money like in the tailgate or do you just mm -hmm. do it for be honest? No, I make money in the tailgate. I yeah. sell I sell things. I make a lot of money in the tailgate because I'm selling shirts, right? Yeah. yeah. But let's talk about other types of events. Like uh, sort of so I do I host a lot of these networking photo shoots and yeah. since yeah. I run a media company and I'm good at marketing I want to know all the best. I want to network with all the best photographers. Yeah. I want to network with all the best cinematographers. I want to network with all the best influencers that are ambitious, actually. And I also want to network with a lot of cool guys that actually own these mansions, own these villas, own the, the yacht broker in Austin, right? Luxury yacht broker. I want to yeah. network with them, right? And then, you know, you end up doing their commercial. So with events like that, those are more networking events that you end up making money from indirectly and take it a step deeper than that. Then I show that media online on my Instagram. Like a lot of people don't hear me talk like this on my Instagram. And there's a reason for that because I need the eyeballs. I need the attention. So then that the, uh, the mortgage broker thinks it's just really fucking cool that a lot of the stuff that I have going on, right? And, you know, I'm filtering out people. If you don't think it's cool, if you don't want to look at that stuff, then you're not going to do business with me. But it's something like that is so rare that then the accountant wants to be around me. And then I invite, and this actually happened, I invite that accountant to Michael Sartain's bikini, big bikini competition he did yeah. with Vegas Dave. I invite my accounting client there. And then he's networking with Miss Brazil 2016 and telling her adve investment advice to help her mom back in Brazil. And then, uh, you know, getting in rooms like that. And he's the only accountant in that type of room. Back yeah, to, yeah. you don't want to be at the accounting convention. If you're an accountant, you want to go to the room where a lot of high status people are, the guys with the tables that are spending tens of thousands of dollars in one night, 
or the influencers that you can then get to promote your accounting firm and get yeah, more yeah. business because who can who who knows who knows more rich guys who knows more rich guys an accountant on linkedin or an influencer an attractive model with hundreds of thousands of followers who knows more rich guys which one yeah so <clears throat> yeah uh, those yeah. are net- yeah. networking events you want to be at <laughs> yeah true true do you do your networking events now or do you like go to other networking events and- so for about over two years now i've done my own events and yeah. it happened yeah. pretty fast it happened okay. uh you know, I just talked about that. I just talked about that bikini competition that Michael Sartain yeah, yeah, hosted yeah. with Vegas Dave. It was that event that inspired me to do my own events, but in yes. Austin, in in a in a smaller city that really didn't have it going on. Yeah, yeah. And Austin had it going on back in the day, but I was starting to see the decline, and I was like, "Wow, Austin can really do something exciting right now." So from that event, I was living in the Bay Area at that time. Check this out. From that event, and this is how decisive you have to be with what you want to do. From that event, in less than 90 days, I packed my bags. I moved to Austin and I said, I'm going to do events, right? And so I set up, this was right before COVID. I set up two South by Southwest events. They were like, the basis for them was... um music media and models right so you would have your music artists come you would have models come influencers and then you would have the media people the photographers and everyone i wanted to actually interact with being that i already i'm running a media company right i need them to do a lot of stuff for my clients so i set up those two events and the week of south by southwest the whole country goes into lockdown and uh we can't we can't do anything we can't do events and we can't be places right so yeah. that was a that was a huge that was a huge turning point to where I was like, dang, dude, I came here just for events, and now we I can't do events. What what the what the hell, right? Uh, and then it turns out that Texas was a pretty uh, you know was a they valued their freedom and they let us get out a little bit more. And so what I did all summer is I would go out to a lot of the parks in Austin and and stuff, and we'd. We'd actually speaking of going out and partying, we we just had turned the parks into parties, basically. So you go out to the river and you meet people and I would meet I would meet cool guys and I would meet attractive girls and tell them, hey, I'm throwing events in Austin. You know, we have big events coming in the future. Add me on Instagram and I'll put you on the list. Right. So that's how I built my list while nothing was going on. And then uh, I eventually someone someone that I met during that whole time. Right. Actually, I met them right when I got to Austin. One of the girls that I met, she then ends up connecting with connecting me to a lot of, you know, people that are well connected in the city. The people that are on the yachts, the people that are on the mansions, the people that have a lot of uh, different events going on and stuff like that. Right. So you really have to be intentional and really have to be intentional about what you're trying to do. I came to Austin for events. I set up the events. They got shut down by Corona. Okay, so then I'm now meeting people and future projecting and putting them on the list because we are going to have events in the future. And then when I do find out where to have the event, I then I'm then inviting them. Right. So my first, I mean, I was the first one to do events in Austin, and that really helped people look at my name become known across event coordinators in other cities like. LA and Vegas, Miami, even across the world, places like Singapore, stuff like that. So they're like, wow, Juan, like you're really doing events out there. And doing events while no one was doing events was a real good advantage to have here in Texas. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So before we go, can you talk about like, uh, so if someone wants to, you know, hire you as a like, marketer, so how, how can mm-hmm. they find you? They can find me on Instagram mainly. Yeah. So here, here's what you do. Type in Juan Tucker must die on Instagram. Go through whatever I'm posting at the time on my stories. Go through all my highlights. Go through my photos. And you'll be like, damn, this dude is a marketer. And then you yeah. DM me and you say, <laughs> and you say, hey, <laughs> what's going on? And you yeah. tell me a little bit about your business. So that's the best place to find me. You can also find me on places like LinkedIn, Juan Garcia. I had one thing I did with my brand over the years is I stopped serving accountants. Remember how I went straight into accountants? 
So yeah. I actually messed up and I'll be very quick on this, but I actually, not that I messed up. It's just that I needed to do that at the time. I pigeoned myself into being called the CPA marketer. And then people thought yeah. I could only market accountants when really I can freaking market a pizzeria if I wanted to, right? Because I understand, yeah. yeah, I understand attention. So I need to make a new podcast. Actually, that's what I need to do because I used to have an accounting podcast. I need to okay, yeah. post different types of things on LinkedIn. But yeah, go connect with me. The best place is on um, Instagram, Juan Tucker Must Die. So okay. is, is the name from a movie? Yeah. It's from a movie called John Tucker Must Die. Yeah, John yeah, yeah, yeah. Die, I, I yeah. saw a trailer, yeah. You know, <laughs> I would really love to have my at on Instagram be Juan Garcia. I used to have the official Juan Garcia Jr. That account got taken down. But uh, everyone has my name down here. I, I live uh, in, te- <laughs> in Texas. Like, yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, everyone is Juan Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, great. So the final question, um, what does freedom mean to you? I think freedom is living a life by design, not being shackled by anything, even, you know, and I'm not talking about, uh, we talked about the golden handcuffs already. One thing we yeah. didn't talk about is politics. Don't be, you know, held down by politics either, right? You know, yeah. it, it sort of matters who becomes president, but don't let that really matter for your life. Whoever becomes president, figure it out anyway, like figure out some way around it, right? So a life of freedom means that you're living a life by your own design. And, you know, living that life is not a mindset. You can actually tactically write it out and figure out the steps to get where you want to, whether that's in the next 90 days, the next three months, the next three years, or even the next 10 years, right? So, you know, there's there's ways to do it. It's not something you just imagine and it's a vision board and it's a dream board. You can you can have the vision board, just make sure there's tactical steps to actually achieve those goals on your vision board. Yeah. Uh, so so Juan, so it's great to have you on the podcast. It's been a great experience. Thank you for coming. Um, Thank you, man.